folk uh, connection today, so I just want to make sure I see uh, the order. Well, I don't see any other concerts, so I guess I'll just try to keep an eye on the order of arrival. So, having said that, I will raise the ceremonial meat tenderizer. Good morning and welcome to the Boston City Council. My name is Matt O'Malley. I'm the City Council representing District 6. I'm also the Chair of the Committee on Environment, uh, Resiliency and Parks. Um, I am joined today by City Councilor Kenzie Bach uh, to discuss her uh, really wonderful initiative. It is Docket 1101, uh, and a hearing order on creating a conservation core for the City of Boston. Uh, we'll be joined by some incredible panelists, uh, some great uh, city officials, some great activists, including Chief Chris Cook, Commissioner Ryan Woods, Trin Wen, Sarah Anderson uh, from the Mayor's Administration, as well as Ms. Anderson is a Senior Manager of Career Pathways at American Forests. Uh, we'll also hear from some wonderful uh, colleagues and great advocates in this space, including Jesse Scott III, David Meshalam, Pat Alvarez, and David Queeley. Um, and then uh, equally important, looking forward to hearing some great public testimony from a number of uh, great tree advocates and environmental uh, warriors such as Sarah Freeman, Laura Holmes and Caroline Reeves among others. Um, this public hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city council dash TV. Uh, it will be rebroadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN 82, as well as Verizon Fios uh, 964. Uh, we'll take public testimony at the end of this hearing, and if you wish to testify via video conference, please email Ron Cobb, our city messenger, at ron.cobb, -B, that's two Bs, at boston.gov to sign up. Uh, in the interest of time, we will forego Councillor's opening statements today, with the exception of Councillor Bach, who would like to make a couple of uh, uh, remarks upon my concluding. Um, I also did want to acknowledge the councillor at large, Michael Flaherty, has joined us as well. Welcome, Councillor Flaherty. Um, and just very, very briefly wanted to, if you're watching this hearing, you either care deeply about environmental initiatives or follow the city council closely. And I've been so uh, really honored to work with so many incredible colleagues through the years, pushing some really innovative and exciting environmental initiatives. And this is certainly among them. So count me among the uh, many uh, supporters and acolytes of this idea. Obviously, we're coming on the end of the council's uh, calendar year which means our dockets will close. So likely um, there won't be action taken on this, uh, but looking forward to continuing the work next year and certainly count me as an eager uh, and willing partner uh, and participant in making this a reality. Um, I did want to say from the offset, uh, I am on uh, day two of my paternity leave. So there may be a case where I have to hand the reins over to the lead sponsor, Councillor Bach, to run this hearing. Uh, but right now, uh, my little Margot is, uh, is napping peacefully. So uh, we'll see how long this lasts. Um, delighted to be with all of you. Thank you again, Councillor Liz Braden has joined us from District 9. Um, and we will forego Councillor's opening statement, but for the lead uh, author on this, Councillor Bach, if you had any uh, brief opening uh, remarks. Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, um, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today. This is very much the beginning of a conversation. Um, in some ways, it, well, in some ways it's continuing a conversation. Um, it's long been in the works actually. Councillor O'Malley and Councillor Wu co-sponsored a resolution with where the council supported the federal Green New Deal um, now several years ago. Uh, and uh, the one of the cornerstones of that is the idea of a conservation core. And the idea itself comes to us from the original New Deal a time in which we planted more than you know half the trees that have ever been planted in the U.S. were planted in that time, um, and it was really uh, a, a marriage of you know key work that we needed for our um, green public realm and also a jobs program. Um, and I think that the uh, moment for that has come again, um, and um, and that while we look for federal leadership on this front, we don't have to wait as a city. Um, and so the the conception behind this hearing order today was really, how do we start thinking about tying together some of the existing threads um, that we have in the city, working on uh, sort of new frontiers when it comes to tree planting, when it comes to green infrastructure, when it comes to building retrofits, um, and really seize the reins uh, and, and think about how we're gonna scale up a public workforce, how we're gonna scale up opportunities um, as we sort of help to create and drive demand for new industries in the city, um, how, how we actually create training pathways um, and, and job opportunity pathways for our Boston residents, for residents of color. Um, there are several promising programs that have launched on this front. There's a, a really strong green infrastructure one in Philadelphia. Uh, there's one working with folks who have lost their jobs from COVID in Austin, one working with unhoused folks in Seattle, one working with youth in LA. Um, 
So this is a this is a thing where we are not alone. Um, and one of the things we're looking forward to doing in the new year is having some of the other cities in that are working on this type of stuff and talking through the nuts and bolts of their programs. Um, Cause I'm really trying to drive us in the direction of how we, how we make budgetary um, and capital commitments towards actually hitting our targets um, in so many of the plans from uh, urban forestry to green infrastructure um, to building retrofits that the city is pursuing. How do we sort of get there from here? Um, and how do we use a local homegrown Boston workforce to do it? Um, so that's, that's really the goal. I think that the budget nuts and bolts of this and the comparison with other cities is all stuff that we're gonna really get into the weeds of in the new year. Um, what my team and I found as we started to dig into this is how much promising work is being done in Boston already. Things that are often small and at a pilot scale, um, but really have the opportunity to scale up. And so we wanted to hold this hearing today, um, both to hear from Chief Cook and, uh, um, and Commissioner Woods uh, and uh, um, our director from the Office of Workforce Development, Trin Nguyen, um, about the existing city stuff, and then the many sort of nonprofit um, actors who are in the space already. And we did decide to bracket, we've bracketed the building retrofits piece because it's so big, um, and we're going to need a whole nother hearing related to that. So today, talking mainly about the opportunities for a conservation core when it comes to urban forestry and green infrastructure. Um, but I'm thrilled to start getting these uh, threads out on the table so that we can pull them together um, and really, uh, really re envision in the coming year. Um, how, how Boston can create opportunities for our youth, uh, meet the calls for, um, for racial equity, for economic equality in our city, and also at the same time meet this uh, deep challenge of our generation when it comes to tackling climate change. So thank you and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Councilor Bach. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for uh, uh, acknowledging that we're gonna suspend opening statements. We're going to hear from the administration panel first, then we'll get into councilors' questions and opening statements. The order will be, and I want to thank everyone who has arrived, several more have joined us. Uh, Boston City Councilor at large, Michael Flaherty of South Boston uh, will be first, uh, followed by City Councilor Liz Braden of uh, Alston Brighton, followed by City Councilor Frank Baker of Dorchester, and then City Councilor at large, Anissa Asaibi George. So thank you, colleagues. Uh, and obviously, as more colleagues join, uh, you will be added to their, they will be added to the queue. Uh, Chief Cook, did you want to introduce your panel and then uh, take it away? I'd love that, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll be brief because I think the most important thing uh, to hear from is the nonprofit partners as well as the community activists who'd like to testify on this issue. But I do think it's important to have some sort of context as to what the city does already. And a lot of this work is represented by uh, Chief Marty Martinez and his cabinet, as well as Chief John Barros. And some of the numbers that I'm going to talk about now are the direct result of the hard work of uh, Rashad Cope and the Director of Youth Engagement and Employment and uh, the hardworking people over there. So just a bit of context for the city. Annually, the city partners with roughly 200 organizations to put youth to work and teach career job skills and to build on those skills uh, so hopefully they can have successful pathways in life. Each summer, about 8,000 youth jobs are provided. And in Boston, roughly half of youth participating in Boston's summer jobs indicate that they help pay for one or more household bills and one in five report that they are saving for college tuition. So that you see that these jobs, you know, in addition to learning life skills, they actually have an economic impact in the families that are represented. But of course, the climate crisis itself is the biggest challenge of our lifetime. And as we see with COVID-19, how socially vulnerable populations are the most affected, that's gonna be the exact same case with the climate crisis. And we're already seeing that. We see that with the effects of heat island effect. We see that with stormwater management and we see that with sea level rise. And so how can we get young people trained in jobs of climate adaptation that will most benefit the communities they come from? And I think that's really the opportunity here. Um, something, uh, an important context about how 2020 and 2020 was different for a lot of reasons, but obviously youth jobs were different as well. And, you know, this summer youth job program was different because of coronavirus, but it, it also highlighted the dedication we have to provide these important opportunities and make sure that they're really strongly connected 
to these life skills in a very substantive way. So Mayor Walsh, in partnership with the council, committed an additional $4.1 million to the Mayor's Youth Summer Job Program. And we supported those youth aged 14 to 29 in attaining those summer jobs. You know, that made the uh, total funding for youth engagement and employment this year to 11.9. And all of those jobs had to be adapted to the pandemic. So um, as we talk about a conservation core for the city of Boston, in another porter, that was the broad view of youth jobs in the city of Boston. I think it's important to hear from Commissioner Woods about the exact programs that are happening in partnership with the Parks and Recreation Department. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Woods. And then of course myself, as well as Trin Wen, the director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development are both here to answer any questions. So if it's all right, Councilor O'Malley, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Woods. Of course, uh, Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, Chief. You. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're very fortunate in our uh, Boston Parks Department to have 30 urban wilds across the city under our jurisdiction that make up for approximately about 200 acres of our public open space. As Chief Cook mentioned, um, this was a very different COVID year. On a typical year, we have volunteer hours just north of 1,000. Um, of groups coming in to help us uh, maintain, clean, preserve these urban spaces. Um, this past COVID year, we had 50 hours. So a big drastic difference in the amount of work um, that usually happens and the need is still there. Uh, we currently partner with our urban wilds with the Southwest Boston CDC, NOAA and corporate groups. In the past, a lot of work was done with the Boston Natural Areas Network. Um, we also partner more recently with Speak for the Trees on some tree identifications and finding uh, future potential locations and empty tree pits um, that need to be filled. Currently, we have jobs in the city overall related to this work. We do a lot of work at the golf course, um, training youth with the landscaping jobs, ground maintenance, um, irrigation that we're teaching, as well as the Blue Shirts program that the chief mentioned. Um, we put out a, the Parks Department has a staffer that puts out a seven to eight week program for youth. These youth are 14 to 25 years old. As mentioned with the blue shirts, we were trying to find a, a program that would allow for social distancing and uh, out in the outdoors. So we were able to come up with a system with six different regions of work, each region getting 25 to 40 youth. Um, and that was all dependent on where the youth lived and their, uh, their ability to get to the work site. But in addition to the regular work that they're doing, whether it be at the golf courses or in the urban wilds or out in the general parks, there's a lot of lessons that are being taught through this. So job skills, for example, for many, this is their first job. So they're learning how to report to a work site, signing in and signing out. Leadership development and work and the importance of working as a team. Ecology, math and science work. Um, one example that's touted was in the urban wilds, we were talking about creating a new trail so the youth were learning about slopes and they were using math such as rise over run, making the connections that they were learning in the classrooms to the work that they were doing out in the field. Another one, a group, a youth group was building a bioswale with rocks and they had to figure out how big does this swale have to be and how um, much water will it be able to, to hold. The climate change lessons, resiliency projects, plant and wildlife literacy, arboriculture, and some of the youth have taken these lessons home. So the stuff that they've learned, they come in the next day touting, this is what we were able to do in our backyard, or this is what we did at our own home. So um, we're teaching the general um, work, the landscaping work, the important conservation work, but the life lessons and the job skills are very important to this. And we're very grateful for that $4.1 million source of funding that we had this summer to put additional youth to work in these jobs. That'll pass it back to Chief Cook. Thank you, uh, Councillor. And uh, if possible, I think it would be good for Trin Wen to highlight a few programs as well. Of course. Ms. Wen, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I do have to leave at 930, but I'm going to back, hop back on at 10 to answer additional questions. Um, in addition to what my colleagues talked about in terms of workforce development skills and industry experience, um, we do have models, successful um, national models in the city on registered state apprenticeships with the building pathways, um, green energy maintenance. Um, we also have um, learn and earn models with our community colleges in the green and jobs core industries. 
um, within our tuition-free community college, there are six schools in which we pay for tuition and student support for. And uh, in addition, we do have um, summer industry interns with actual employers in the field, in climate action fields, so that young people can get um, not only credits for um, their um, academic learning while they're working at the same time. So happy to talk more about that in details and the results on that. I'm all set, thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Counselor. Thank you, um, Ms. Wynn. Thank you, uh, Chief Cook. Before we get to questions, I'm also going to ask uh, uh, Ms. Anderson, we're going to, if you wouldn't mind uh, making your opening statement, we're going to include, even though you're not part of the administration, we're going to include you in the first panel for uh, counselors' questions and answers. So you'll be the Counselor, last. I'd just like to say uh, for the purposes of this council hearing, uh, she is a honorary member of the administration today. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, congratulations, Ms. Anderson. Uh, make sure the chief shares his uh, parking spot with you in the executive garage. It's the best perk of the job. And uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the um, Environment, Resiliency, uh, Parks and Parks Committee. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the American Forests. Um, and um, my work is um, exactly encompassing of what you're doing, um, is to build career pathways into urban forestry and our allied professions across the country. And so we are thrilled that the city is considering um, the development of uh, a city conservation corps. Um, these kinds of uh, pre-employment programs are critical to actually fill what is indeed a shortage of uh, folks in our field. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that we are on track to grow um, just the particular tree trimmer and pruner designation, which doesn't even include landscaping and, and horticulture and all of our allied professions by 10% through 2028. Um, we have 8,000 um, annual job openings across the country that we already know about and many, many more um, in other uh, employers that we we are constantly um, getting getting asked about to fill um, in both uh, the private sector as well as uh, the nonprofit sector. Um, and even in the public sector, we need um, as many skilled, trained, qualified uh, uh, tree care and green industry professionals as we can get. And so programs like these are critical to help fill that gap. And ideally, our vision at American Forests is to fill that gap with folks who could use these opportunities most. So targeting folks in lower income communities who also on average have lower tree canopy cover um, than other um, more wealthy communities um, in cities. Um, that's where we're hoping to focus our work and hoping to help you build capacity in any way that we can. So um, thank you again for, for having us. Um, I'm excited to give a little bit more context um, about the work that we have been doing to build the capacity of cities across the country and, and these kinds of job training programs to, to get more folks in the field um, a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Anderson. Um, to begin the questioning, appreciate all for that great overview. Uh, we're going to go to the lead sponsor, Councillor Bach. You are up, uh, followed by Councillor Flaherty. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to all the panelists. Uh, I guess, um, and, and thank you also, Chief Cook, for uh, talking about the youth jobs program. I think it's so important, SuccessLink, and I was really glad that we had more money in it this summer. Um, and I think, I think to me, um, thinking about what Director Wynn said about the sort of existing community college programs, and then we think about our existing summer jobs, like it seems to me like we have a bunch of, uh, not to use an infrastructure analogy, but a bunch of disconnected pieces of a pipe, right? And we sort of, we need to connect them, weld them together um, to, to make a, a straighter pipeline into, um, into these jobs uh, for our youth. So that like, what I want to see is how do we go from a summer where folks learn about urban wilds um, to a systematic program across the city that supports having more urban wilds? Or how are we going to supplement um, as we think about it, the urban forestry plan that was funded in the budget this summer? Um, I'm interested if you or, uh, or Commissioner Woods could just talk about sort of um, the beginnings of how you would think about scaling up to actually meet the need there. Because we uh, we talked, we were talking last night with Boston Water and Sewer, and they were talking about how they've piloted a bunch of green infrastructure in a couple places, Audubon Circle, um, East Boston. Uh, and it seems like we're learning more and more about what 
what these things look like on the ground, but still in sort of these tiny instances. And when you think about the scale of what we would need to do to transform the city for climate justice, it's uh, it's it's overwhelming. And so I, I just I wonder um, if the city has looked at all at what other places are doing from a job training perspective. If um, and and also well, I don't know. And this is I don't mean to put um, turn on the spot, but whether there's any other instance of something where the city itself has started to create more demand for a type of job. And so then we think about proactively, how do we meet that demand with, um, as Ms. Anderson alluded to, you know, the types of candidates we would like to give more opportunities to rather than having it all go to um, low bid contractors who are maybe coming in from out of state and such. So that's, it's a sort of broad set of questions, but um, that was what everybody's comments sort of made me think of is, is how we join up and, uh, and broaden this pipeline. So Director Wynn, I, I don't know if you want to start, but I could start with sort of the climate reality of the, the sort of scope of the situation, if that's helpful. Uh, yes, that is. I, I do have um, responses and an answers and resources, some action steps that we're already taking uh, to counselors box questions. Okay, so why don't, why don't you go ahead? Because I know that you're under a time constraint. Yes, I apologize. I have another uh, child care and workforce development uh, call um, at 9.30, but I'll hop back on. Um, you know what, Councillor Bach, I really appreciate your questions around um, aligning systems for a more uh, smooth transition on the continuum of this um, internship, high school matriculation into uh, post-secondary education in urban forestry. That's something that we're working with uh, Chief Cook on in terms of building the infrastructure so that we can meet the demand of um, the uh, upcoming, uh, what we call green jobs in the climate action plans. Um, a couple of examples in which we're already doing that is one is that this summer, we had pilot a fourth track in our summer youth program as Chief Cook had talked about. And that track is a um, pipeline, a bridge program from the success link youth into post-secondary education. So 460 young people in success link and in the city of Boston got to experience post-secondary education in any of the six um, tuition-free community college programs uh, that our partners were offering. Uh, in addition to that, we paired it with um, success link career coaches to help young people not only take courses, but think about um, post-secondary education and then their careers as they're uh, receiving stipends and working in the summer so that we know that this summer six to eight weeks summer uh, youth program isn't enough. So we are building a vision for them to look at post-second ed as soon as they transition after the youth programs. Now, the one area that we are building to design our industry. So we didn't want to pigeonhole young people to take certain courses Although we had six industries that were focused, we didn't want to force young people to think about these six industries. So in the future, what we're gonna do is maybe build out more of this green job core for young people that connects the existing infrastructure that you're talking about, which is our tuition-free community college, success link and youth programs, but then focusing more on career credentials for young people as well as work experience. Um, we also have uh, specific examples in our Building Pathways program, which is in a pre, uh, registered uh, pre-apprenticeship program in the building trades um, that was initiated in 2016 by Mayor Walsh. And that helps young people or Boston residents to learn more about getting into any of the 18 building trades apprenticeships, such as electrician, plumber, carpenter, sheet metal, and a worker, et cetera. And while they're working into these trades, we provide them with a green maintenance or green construction management context so that they're learning the credentialed skills, but then providing them with the context and climate uh, change as well. So. Um, we're already thinking about um, and have those vision, but you're absolutely right, Counselor, that we need to start building these nuts and bolts 
to provide this seamless, smooth transition that you're talking about. I'm happy to talk more about um, other uh, specific examples. Um, I do want to uh, caveat by saying that you're you're right again, Councilor Bach, by saying that you're, we're seeing smaller pockets of these good efforts and best practices. And the challenge is trying to get all the partners in place to look at and create uh, MOUs, articulated agreements with the state, and then also um, go to scale. Uh, so it's not just one or two here or three or four or a class of 12, but how do we go to scale with the residents that we have in the pipeline? Thank you. Councilor, I, I don't have much to add except for uh, just on that last scale component, which I think was the part, the first part of your question is, you know, how do we scale up to meet the challenge and our climate adaptation efforts are going to require a workforce that is larger than the, we the one we have in green infrastructure right now, which presents a huge opportunity to connect to communities of color, which is the work that Trin does every single day on behalf of the city. So it's really just matching, you know, the need and the opportunity uh, to our kids to make sure that they're participating in this, uh, this new job sector that we're creating with these plants. It's not the capitalization of these projects that is the issue, it's the operations and maintenance associated with these systems, the green infrastructure that Commissioner Woods is putting into parks, the bioswales, the stormwater management that water and sewer is employing, you know, the permeable sidewalks that Public Works is, is using. All of that requires operations and maintenance. It's a huge job opportunity. It's a huge challenge facing us, but it's also a great opportunity to put our kids to work. Great, thank you so much, Chief Cook. And I'm mindful, I'm sure I've gone over my time. I only wanted to just ask if uh, uh, Ms. Anderson wanted to add anything, any concrete example of seeing any of this kind of actually be figured out. Yeah, so I'll just say that the, the biggest point of leverage um, and power that municipalities have in helping advance career pathways into um, green infrastructure, um, you know, planting and maintenance um, is actually through the contracts, through the contracting process. So um, making sure that uh, who, who, whatever um, qualified contractors are bidding on city contracts to do the actual maintenance and, and planting work that is necessary to build a more resilient Boston uh, making sure that the requirements for those contractors um, include, uh, or or maybe there's preferential uh, uh, treatment given to um, uh, small minority women-owned businesses, um, businesses that are uh, founded by folks from the reentry population, um, businesses that hire and employ city residents, or folks who are um, opportunity youth who are facing barriers to employment. Um, and veterans, I mean, there are many, many different ways that the city can require that the folks who are actually doing this work are um, representative of the communities that you'd like to engage and um, can holding those contractors to a high standard. Um, I've seen that work um, very well in Washington, DC. I've seen set aside work very well for uh, local core groups. Um, so set aside to say, okay, we're, we're not gonna have the youth who are being trained on, on, on this kind of work um, climb the trees, right? But we're going to have them do early maintenance and kind of low level, um, kind of safer, um, hands-on um, uh, maintenance activities um, in, in other kinds of, of green infrastructure um, besides just trees, you know, bio swales and rain gardens and other kinds of, um, of, of green infrastructure maintenance. Um, we're going to set aside those kinds of projects for these types of core groups who are getting their feet wet and getting that, that necessary training. So lots of opportunities here for the city to kind of intervene and, and um, prioritize um, these communities and, and, and get that work done. Great, thank you. Yeah, contracting is so important. And also I think the opportunity to bring some of this work in-house, we contract out a lot of our tree work right now. And anyways, I'm done with my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, you're up. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for hosting. Obviously, thank the uh, the lead sponsor, Councilor Bach, and uh, it's great to see uh, our, our uh, chief and our commissioner uh, in uh, Sarah Anderson as well, and others that are attending. And uh, you folks know I've obviously been a 
longtime supporter of establishing and expanding the city sponsored training opportunities for youth and and uh, particularly as it pertains to our underserved populations uh, for years. I'm on record uh, probably like around the mid 2000s. Um, the previous administration had this uh, harebrained idea about moving City Hall uh, out to dry dock four where no one could get to it. And so I challenged that and also talked about the, the need to clean City Hall and to start creating uh, green sector jobs and to start to train our youth. So uh, I'd say that's probably around 2006, 2007. So a uh, long time supporter. Uh, I get uh, three basic questions. Um, I think Trent may have answered one of them. And the first of which is, how can we expand current partnerships uh, with the mayor's office uh, you know, of youth development in particular? You know, we've known them as the green shirts. We've known them as the red shirts. We've known them as the blue shirts. So uh, there may be an opportunity through the mayor's office of youth development to uh, to kind of uh, connect folks to, to green sector jobs. The other one, I think maybe Twin Trent had answered, which is, can you share more details about the green job development in the trade certification? Uh, really specifically the trade certification that's being done at uh, Building Pathways, which is a great program that the mayor had created uh, that's doing great work on a number of fronts. And lastly, can you provide uh, some more information about the uh, industry partners that the city works with around getting uh, young people trained and uh, mentoring and getting them the job, job experience that they need uh, in the green job sector? And I appreciate uh, all the work that you guys do um, day in and day out to to put our city's best foot forward and I'm appreciative of the this administration's attention to detail. Uh, they get it uh, and there's been a renewed focus on uh, on exactly this. I, I think the previous administration was a little slow to come around on it, but uh, we're here today and uh, let's continue to push forward. And, uh, and again, I appreciate the efforts of uh, the lead sponsor and, and our chair. Our chair has been uh, on it from day one since he joined the council and the environment has been a huge priority of his. So it's been a welcome addition um, to the council. And he's been a great voice uh, and a leader uh, for all of us to to continue to sort of push the envelope on you know how we can do better and how we can be more sustainable and how we could open up doors uh, in the green sector for for uh, our underserved communities. So thank you all, and look forward to the answers. And again, I think Trent may have touched on it, unless I want to expand a little bit more on the certification piece. Yeah. Thank I'll you, Mr. Good. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'll be very brief on it because I actually think you'll hear some direct expertise in the second panel. Uh, specifically around green infrastructure certification and the opportunity that provides. Um, if we could get kids, uh, young people certified uh, in green infrastructure practices, then through the contracting practice, we could actually require some of the contracts that we put out to require some of that green certification on part of their teams. And if our kids are overrepresented among those certified in green infrastructure, hopefully that would lead them on a career pathway. I would say that largely uh, the park management and operations field is changing though to adapt to the climate adaptation features. You know, we're no longer the traditional landscaping of mow the grass and clean the trash. Now there's a lot more care that has to go into these systems that are just adjusting to our climate reality. And so there is, there is still that existing workforce opportunity, but there are also nonprofits in the city that are already training these kids in the fields of the future. So whether it's Southwest CDC or the Emerald Necklace Conservancy or others who employ youth in these techniques, um, th those are the existing partnerships that we have to scale up to meet the challenge. Commissioner Woods, I don't know if there's any other programs you wanna highlight. I know in the second panel, David Quilly would be talking specifically on this issue. I would just add in the terms of the Blue Shirts, our outreach efforts, obviously this year, uh, constrained bringing this program back with not having school in session. So trying to really work and filter through the nonprofits to get that uh, work out to the neighborhoods as well as the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, but really trying to engage. And that's something we want to continue to strengthen um, by trying to get that opportunities out there in, in the hands of these kids. And that was um, the, the challenge this year with the program put together and not having kids in schools um, to, to get that to them, but continuing to find new ways to um, get this reach into their hands and have the proper engagement. Very good, then. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Good to see you and the Chief. And Commissioner, I, I, I bet you didn't think that singing lessons came with the, the job as Commissioner uh, Parks, but uh, you did a great job on TV the other night. Thanks. Lots of shower practice. <laughs> Here, here. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty, and and well done, uh, well done, uh, Commissioner Woods. Uh, it was great, um, uh, terrific job, uh, Councillor Braden. Uh, you're up. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm very, very excited about the prospect of having a, a conservation corps in Boston. Um, I think it's just what we need to develop those career pathways for our young people into the green infrastructure space. And um, I'm just wondering in terms of um, a timeline, like, can we, can we, I think it's a great idea. Um, can have you have uh, you folks thought about um, you know um, a timeline for that and and um, and a targeted number of folks that we would need to be trained to meet the demand for all the work that we expect to be done? I think so that might be for Chief Cook. <laughs> yeah. So, Councilor, I mean, we we would really welcome a conversation with the council, especially around the budget development for the upcoming year. I will say that it's it's not so much um, a lack of resources. I mean, obviously, in partnership with the council, you saw the amount of resources that the mayor allocated towards youth jobs. A lot of this work is about that very um, complicated and direct connective tissue that can be provided to the supervision um, of this work. What you don't want is you don't want a group of kids, um, you know, 30 or 40 kids that are having an underwhelming experience yeah. with these industries. You want them to sort of fall in love with this and recognize that these are jobs of the future. I mean, nationwide right now, but especially acutely in Massachusetts, there's a, there's a shortage of arborists, of trained arborists. I mean, it's a huge field and it's good paying jobs and it's jobs that will last for decades of work because urban forestry and forestry in general is becoming more and more critical to state and local governments. You know, if kids fall in love with this type of work, they can actually be gainfully employed and provide for their families for a long period of time. Yeah. But you got to make sure that they have a good experience. And so, you know, scaling up those that we can actually partner with so that the kids are having a full wraparound experience and not just going through the motions of doing these yeah. activities. That, that's really the challenge, Councillor. Yeah. Um, you know, I think per, um, also in terms of curriculum, like I think thinking out, outside the immediate box with curriculum development in our high schools so that there might be a, a environmental science or green infrastructure um, curriculum that would that tied into climate change that would, that would, um, that they could get some high school, they can get some credits. Um, college credits or whatever. I, th I think pairing it with trying to identify, I think a turn on, turning kids off by having a bad experience is probably a big, a big, big concern. So uh, it wouldn't be about numbers, but more about, about quality and, um, and uh, a, a really constructive and, and valuable experience is probably the best way to go. So um, you're talking to the right person here. Uh, Councillor Bach is a, a big proponent here. So she, she's in charge of working with the, <laughs> the West Mains Committee. So uh, I, sir, I personally think this would be money well spent. Um, you know, it'll pay dividends in the long term because they're good paying potential to be good, long, stable, long, well, good paying jobs in, in the city that there's obviously a demand for. So um uh, I, I certainly would love to continue the conversation with Councillor Bach and yourselves to figure out what, what, what we can do to support this work. Um, apart from that, I, I'm really excited about the prospect of, of um, this program. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that's all I have for now. I will uh, jump in for the chair and say that next up is Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker. Hi, sorry, sorry. Um, I think that I think that this is a, I think that this is a um, really good idea. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Um, so, I've talked to people in New York. They have <clears throat> ten thousand people are, that are available for day labor, and it's mostly for snow removal and storms. Would there ever be a way that we could? <clears throat> um maybe create some kind of fund for 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 a labor fund and then and then just um pick out particular parks and in in and pay that way so it's not contracts I, I i i'm not really into more contracts because 
just because I'm not. I very much think that we should be bringing some more people in house. And if we do the day labor route, we're able to figure out through the people that come through our, come through our projects, we're able to figure out who's going to be well suited to work and work in the parks or, 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 or work or wherever. Like, as Ryan knows, I have a park out behind my house that I could put 20 people to work for the entire sum, summer. That's just from me walking around the park. It's sort of a sort of an urban wild. It, there's no real uh, play structures or anything like that. But, you know, it's a lot of bramble bush that's over over crowding trees. It's it's trimming trees. It's getting rid of getting rid of um, old old underbrush, it's, it's um, taking care of runoff. So I just want to, you know, pledge, not pledge my support, but, but, you know, voice my support here. I think this is something that's long overdue that we, we should be using our own people, meaning people that are in the streets in Dorchester and South Boston and Roxbury, instead of contracting. The last contract that happened up here, Chris, you and I walked around, those trees are all dead. Every one of them that they planted are all dead because the contractors come in, they see the number on the contract, they plant, they do the bare minimum, and then they're gone. I think if we use this as a as a real, like maybe it's it's something where we figure out a couple contracts that we use that we might be able to do with with um, with an organization. You have an organization and give them the scope of work for a couple parks, Dorchester Park, Franklin Park, Savin Hill Park behind me. And I think we just try it as a, as a pilot and as best we can, you know, let your training, your teaching, but, but also someone that's working with the land has to love the land. It's not like we're going to be able to just, okay, we're going to bring a thousand kids in out of those thousand kids, 750 of them aren't going to want to pick up a shovel. They're not going to want to, you know, they're going to want to do something else. They're going to want to be on a computer. So I would like to start this as the way New York has it, an almost a day labor sort of thing and use it as a way to see who, who, who we would want in our parks and who we could, who we could put in public works and who we could, you know, use it as, as, a, as a training step to bring kids into the city system. And even though the Municipal Research Bureau doesn't like it, I think we need to expand our labor, expand who's actually touching our infrastructure. And I think it should be people in Boston. I think we should be trying to get away from the contract system. Not that, not that we'll ever get away from all the contracts, but I'm sure there's 10 contracts there that we can get away from that are probably $10 million. And let's, let's think of it in terms of that $10 million worth of training that's working just on our infrastructure. Um, and I know that's, that's a little broad and just thrown out there, but that's where my head is. My head is uh, in a, in a, in a sort of um, a day labor sort of program in the winter time, we're shoveling out hydrants and we're shoveling out bus stops in the summertime, we're going around and we're, and we're doing real intensive work in our parks that, that need them. So I appreciate, I, I appreciate Councilor Bach for, for coming up with this and, and having us talk about it. It's something that I've been mentioning to Chris Cook for probably about seven or eight years, uh, uh, um, that day labor program. And again, the day labor is to identify people that want to work and want to come into our system, the city of Boston system. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. More just statements, but I, I, I Chris, I appreciate the work that, that, that you do, and Ryan, you, you've been great, and, um, and of course, I work with Trin on, on the Jobs Trust also. There's opportunities in the Job Trust here. But we need to start thinking a little differently and get away from the, I think, going back administrations, back to White, back to even Collins before that, when we privatized the, 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 the trash the trash collecting and we privatize a lot of stuff because city workers had a bad rap. We still do have a bad rap. Um, but I don't think the city worker today is the same city worker from 1970. I so, would agree with that counselor. And I, I would just also highlight that hopefully the pandemic has highlighted a new appreciation for city workers. I mean, the fact that this city hasn't missed a beat, during the midst of the coronavirus and people keep continue to deliver services, 
you know, whether it's cleaning our streets or cleaning our parks while there's a pandemic raging. I, I agree with you that, you know, this is, there's, there's a new appreciation for the city worker. And I think if there's opportunities to show kids that they can have a fulfilling career with the city, then we should expand on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. I'm just really learning more than anything else today. My only comment would be the, you know, when we think about our young people in particular, many of our young people across the city and the Boston Public Schools are taking AP Environment um, Studies courses. And, you know, this is maybe possibly through this core, a way to engage young people who have an interest um, in this work. So, you know, I, I would just say if we could make sure that we are connected to um, that programming, especially in, in one of the challenges within BPS with AP programming is there isn't a, a really strong on-ramp to that course of study, but adding this interest um, may help promote that. So that, that's all I really have to add to the conversation because I am just sort of learning more about this um, and look forward to the next panel as well. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you. Just just subbing in here. Yeah, um, sub <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Councillor Savi George. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley. It's been a very informative hearing. Um, this is a proposal that I support. Thank you to um, Chief Cook and Commissioner Ryan Woods as well. And the panelist, I see Sarah Anderson here as well. Uh, Trent was on. Um, I, I especially like Trent's comments and I think maybe Chris talked about it also, but the, the I, I'd like to get a little bit more um, input or, or update on the incredible role the community colleges play in our city. I have great respect for um, Bunker Hill Community College I have great respect for Roxbury Community College, but I, I wanted to know, um, you know, if this was such a program, what would the partnership be? At Urban College as well, um, which is in my district, in Charlestown, um, Bunker Hill Community College, um, we have a satellite office as well in, in the South End. Um, but what type of partnership could we think about in terms of, um, adding community colleges um, and possibly getting some college credits for uh, participants. So Councillor, um, I, I will do a poor Trin impersonation because Trin is um, at another meeting right now, but that is potentially the opportunity to solve the problem that Councillor Braden was alluding to with the supervision of the students and providing a robust experience. And also it relates to Councillor Asabi George's point that this really needs to be connected to curriculum and instructional practices in order for it to have a meaningful payback down the road. So you would imagine that the perfect program would be that a, a, a youth gets some exposure to this field of study through a parks department job, has interest in it, continues that study at Boston Public Schools and then has the opportunity to get certification or further levels of study at the community college, either through a two year or a four year program, you know, whether it's Urban College of Boston, I know Mike Taylor is really invested in this work or Roxbury Community College or Bunker Hill Community College. These are the opportunities where in a very sh relatively short period of time, kids could be receiving a very, uh, excuse me, young people could be receiving a very, very uh, livable wage and a career path for them just because they had some exposure. So I think that is a critical uh, part of the, not only the supervision, but the career path that we would have to establish. I will say it is much more defined in the work of the solar industry, of building retrofits. We've already started those conversations. We've started that work and Trin is already engaged in some of those career pathways. In green infrastructure, this is a place that we can learn from other cities. We can learn from other programs. We have to adapt as a city to our climate reality and how wonderful would it be if our most socially vulnerable kids 
we're actually getting degrees from these universities to learn the job opportunities of the climate crisis. I mean, that's, it's, it's a very strong opportunity and it connects what you and the other counselors were talking about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chief, though. That's good, good comments. And I appreciate that is, um, you know, I, I always say the best social program is a job in, you know, getting a job um, part of that process is getting a good training educational program. And what what was established or what is proposed here, I think is a is is a great plan. Um, you know, connecting connecting community colleges. And you know, I was at I go to the Urban College graduation every year. I think 90, 95% of the of the graduates are, are, are women and mostly uh, women of color, and they work hard all day long, uh, many in the healthcare industry, and then they study at night and they have, they have their children, but you, know, you admire these um, young people. Not, some of them are not so young, but you admire them because nothing was ever given to them, but they're working, working as hard as they possibly can for their family so that they can get a, a good job. So I, I, I would like to see this type of program expand a little bit on that. But having said that, I just wanted to say thank you to the sponsor, um, Council Box. I want to say thank you to Council O'Malley, the um, Commissioner Woods and Commissioner uh, Cook, Chief Cook, and the panelists here as well, and my colleagues. Um, thank you, Councilor O'Malley, uh, for giving me the time. Of course, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Bach, for uh, pinch hitting as I had to uh, step out momentarily. Um, I believe we, we will uh, begin the second panel shortly, but uh, Councillor Bach, I believe you had one more question for this panel. And then if any other councillor has one more question for these panels, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, before uh, Ms. Anderson had to go, just because I think that um, I think you have some experience with what kind of certification and pre-apprenticeship programs can look like in the urban forestry world. And I feel like to Chief Cook's point, um, we sort of know what that looks like in the trades world, um, but we haven't quite gotten there on the forestry side. So I just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit um, and also any of the pieces. I know that you guys are involved in a Baltimore program that's doing some really neat things. So just if you could give a little bit of that before we lose you, that would be great. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, um, Councilwoman Bach. Um, so we, oh gosh, such great commentary today. <laughs> this morning is very exciting to have all this enthusiasm <laughs> around uh, urban forestry positions and and getting folks into the field. So, um, first, I'll start, I'll start. I'll start with that um, topic of uh, credentialing, right? So, in our field in urban forestry, um, the designation of somebody who um, the, the mostly well recognized designation is someone who is a certified arborist. Um, and there are pre-apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs in arboriculture um, to be able to certify folks um, to become arborists. Um, the qualifications um, include several years of experience. So it's not something you can go through in six months and become a certified arborist. You need years of experience and um, um, classroom learning as um, uh, Commissioner Woods is nodding his head. Yes, so there's lots of experience and, and knowledge that's required and it's a high, high standard, but the Massachusetts Arborist Association is um, a fantastic resource. Uh, they are, they certify folks, uh, help certify folks both to become statewide um, certified arborists as well as internationally certified arborists as well. So um, they are, would be a, probably a, the logical partner here to help design a curriculum that would be um, of, of, of an existing pre-apprenticeship program, which, um, you know, from director when um, that's probably the, the route, right, is making sure that whatever core program you all create is a pre-apprenticeship program and then can feed, help feed folks into um, either apprenticeships, um, um, arborist apprenticeships, or right into other kinds of entry-level positions um, afterward, um, and so that they can get the wraparound services that they might need. But um, being a, becoming a certified arborist is, is ideal. Um, in lieu of that, getting certifications in chainsaw safety, in um, um, tree, tree ID, um, OSHA 10, OSHA 30, um, CPR first aid. Um, these are the kinds of qualifications and certifications that employers in our field are looking for. Um, and we'll make, um, 
the youth very competitive. Um, quick, two other points if I can. Um, one is that we've also been in talks with, um, so American Force actually incubated Speak for the Trees Boston. Um, and so David, who will be on the next panel, is very exciting that he's continuing his work to train um, youth. I think they had a summer, successful summer cohort of youth um, training them in, in tree care and um, exposing them to different tree careers, which is exciting. Um, and uh, there's a great, great program for community college, um, the community college topic out of Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, we've been in talks with them. They, they are have the opposite problem where they're thinking, we have this great program, but where are the youth? We would like to put them through this, these courses and, and there might be a potential there to replicate their coursework um, in the Boston community colleges. Um, and then finally, if you're looking to grow in-house, I know I threw out the opportunity of growing via contract, but if you're looking to go in-house, thinking about first the sustainable sources of revenue that are going to be able to fund that expansion are, of course, very important. And so um, I know that in other cities, some, sometimes those funds can come from um, developers who have to cut down trees um, and have to pay fines and, and fees to, to then supplement with planting and other kinds of maintenance. So just one idea, but there's there's many different ways to go about this. We are happy at American Forest to continue to be a resource for you all as you continue to ideate and, and move this topic forward. And just very excited to, to see this momentum and, and, and help cheer you all on. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, no, I think it would be amazing if we could really, uh, you know, if we could, if we had a real elite arborist core um, or really a set of elite arborists employed by the city in-house. And then that creates also a job for a young person in a core to sort of look forward to. Um, and then we would hope that that would also look like our city, right? And that I know that, um, you know, the, the arborist world, we, we really want to see more black arborists. We want to see a much more diverse set. And we have all the pieces here in Massachusetts. We have the best programs like at the university level. So um, yeah, don't, I think that would be great for us. And I guess my... I'm, I'm totally cheating, Mr. Chairman, but because we're also about to lose uh, uh, Commissioner um, Woods and Chief Cook. I just wonder if either of them could speak at all to, it does feel like we have these signature parks in the city. I'm thinking about the big effort at Moakley. I'm thinking about Franklin Park. Um, obviously on my uh, end, there's the common. Um, and, uh, and I just, I wonder about the opportunity to kind of like hub youth crews out of those um, and, and how you guys are, are thinking about that as, again, we think about scaling up the work. Uh, Chief, uh, excuse me, Commissioner, I just promoted you. Congratulations. Do you want to talk about field houses and how work crews work? I lost you at the end. Field houses and how work crews work. Is that what it was? Okay. Yeah, so uh, especially on those projects, I mean, we're having some ex exciting designs. Um, or uh, Moakley particularly that I've seen so far and we're in the process for both the Common and um, Franklin Park, uh, as you mentioned, Council. Um, so we're gonna have a lot more resources at these sites, um, therefore being able to have more youth employed at them. So having stuff such as public bathrooms and amenities, something where we're usually a traveling road show where you go park to park to park, where now we can have people all day be assigned to certain units and have uh, certain parks, I should say, or open spaces. And since we have the resources there, so we really can have more programming for those youths at those spaces. And whether it's having some sort of a conservancy or having some sort of a friends group or having some sort of training program that's out of those individual parks, now that there are amenities that would allow us to employ and have youth be there for a, a whole day instead of packing everybody up in the 12 passenger van and going to the next site. So I think in our design, we're adding those amenities and those features to give the opportunity um, more opportunities for youth to be in those spaces and, and uh, to learn the skills needed. And the only thing I would add to that, counselor, is it builds on success, which is really what we need to do is we need to scaffold on the successful programs. So we run very successful free day camps out of East Boston Stadium and White Stadium and Franklin Park. In off hours, you know, could those also be job hubs for youth who are organized and working in the parks? Great, thanks so much. Um, and thank you, Trin, I see you've just rejoined us. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll stop my questions now because I'm mindful of our second panel. So Mr. Chairman, I don't know, give it back to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Um, thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and for your great work. We, we really do appreciate it. And, and a shout out particularly to uh, Commissioner uh, Wood's uh, team out there who have, particularly amid pandemic, um, who, you know, our parks have become safe spaces and refuge for all of us, certainly for me and my family. So um, thank you for your team specifically this year, particularly this year. Um, not seeing any blue hands from counselors for further questions for this panel, uh, you are dismissed. Um, uh, Carrie, if you wouldn't mind admitting uh, into the room, uh, Jesse Scott, uh, David Meshalam, who I assume is under the Speak for the Trees name, Patricia Alvarez, and I don't see David Queeley uh, in the attendee room, um, but if I am wrong, if you could just please admit him uh, for round two. And then we'll get on uh, with the questioning for round two. Okay, and I see Jesse, uh, Scott the Jesse L. Scott the uh, third, David Meshalam from Speak for the Trees, Patricia Alvarez, um, and perhaps Mr. Creeley from. I think, I think Pat um, may be speaking on behalf of Dave as well because I think his he's had a family thing come up. So okay, so he's, terrific. But she'll speak to some of the green infrastructure work that he does. Okay, great. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Bach. So um, just in order of uh, my notes, uh, Jesse, we're going to have you uh, sort of give a brief opening statement, followed by David, and then Pat, uh, if you want to speak for both uh, Southwest Boston CDC and Codman Square, uh, that would be great. So Jesse L. Scott III, you are up first. Jesse, you're muted. How about now? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, again, good morning, everyone. I uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my name is Jesse Scott. I'm with the USDA Forest Service. I actually work in Boston and I run a program called the Urban Connections Program. And we really focus on connecting people to nature, whether or not that's jobs, education, uh, and everything in between. Um, the Forest Service, uh, as a federal level partner, really is dedicated to continuing our work with Boston. Uh, we've been uh, in the city uh, in this particular program for probably uh, 15 or so years and working with local partners. Um, and some of the things that we've done really, I think, complement complements the work that you're looking to do with uh, a conservation corps. And so we definitely want to be a part of that conversation, definitely want to be working alongside you, definitely want to be looking at ways to engage young people because um, the, the environmental careers that are out there uh, are and, and the ones that are being developed are so important. And I think a lot of people don't really see environmental jobs as real jobs. They don't take it seriously. They don't realize that they can really have a working wage and engaging young people young um, and getting them thinking about the opportunities and the careers is really important, especially when it comes to providing opportunities for them to work during the summers, uh, throughout the school year, uh, because we see that uh, the research shows us that it keeps them from getting in trouble, uh, brings down the crime level, um, you know, really develops them to be able to um, really engage civically uh, and develop their communities in the way we all want our communities to be. And so the Forest Service, uh, although I can't commit us to anything specific, uh, we really want to be there working with you and want to have that conversation, keep that conversation going um, so that, um, you know, we can bring the resources from the federal level um, you know, to the city and work with communities directly. Terrific, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scott. Appreciate uh, you being uh, with us this morning. Uh, Benny Meshalem from Spick for the, excuse me, David Meshalem, Benny is your brother. Uh, David, uh, do you have any opening statement? Thank you, Mr. O'Malley, Councillor O'Malley, and congratulations. I don't think I've seen you since fatherhood. It, it's suiting you well. Um, and thank you, uh, Councillor Bach, for inviting me and sharing in um, this conversation. I think it's we're at a critical juncture right now, uh, not only locally but nationally, to start thinking about some of these issues. And I'm, I'm honored to be here um, for the opportunity. I wanted to, before I begin, just thank um, the Chief Chief Cook and, and Commissioner Woods 
uh, for the past two years, we have been running out of Speak for the Trees, our Teen Urban Tree Corps program, and their partnership and support have been instrumental in helping us provide meaningful and powerful experiences uh, for many of Boston's teens in the field of urban forestry. Um, and of course, none of this would have been possible without the Mayor's Success Link program and the hardworking uh, staff there at the Boston Youth Engagement and Employment Office. Um, and you heard from Sarah Anderson earlier um, and the incubation and support that American Forest has provided us. So I think we, we are right now well positioned to think about how to grow our Teen Urban Tree Corps program. And I'll be speaking later on about how we see that happening. Uh, for the past two years, we've trained over 20 teens in Boston about the importance of our urban forestry and our urban trees. Um, they're amazing kids. I mean, you know, Boston kids, they're so deeply engaged, they're thoughtful. Um, they, they really understand issues, sophisticated issues. And um, this past summer, we, we provided them with uh, some scaffolds and some tools to talk about and explore the urban forest in their community. And I invite you to go on our website and hear directly from them about why they care so much about trees and sort of the history of inequity in our urban forests and a path forward. Um, so firsthand voices. Um, and I think just to frame our conversation a little bit, I think we're at a juncture not only nationally, but also with the leadership of uh, the mayor and the chief and the commissioner embarking on an urban forest master plan. Um, and it's really an opportune time to think about how all these pieces connected, connect. Um, and I just wanna do one more framing here. I think Sarah shared with us a little bit about Springfield. Um, there's also programs, um, UMass Amherst has a very, very strong forestry program. It's a land grant university. Uh, they recently purchased Mount Ida College which is just outside of Boston. And I know there's been conversation around expanding their forestry program locally using Mount Ida as a site for uh, engaging Boston youth and, and young students around thinking about forestry as a career. There's also the DCR Greening the Gateway Cities program, which works in gateway cities in, and trains local youth and employs them to do uh, urban forestry work. And then we have one of the best arboretums in the country, if not the world, that does a lot of youth education and outreach. So I think it's a matter of trying to find a way to connect all these resources um, and to really build a robust program. And, and later on, I can share with you what we've seen happen in other cities across the country and what those partnerships look like. But I think, um, Councillor Bach, this is really the, the right conversation for the right time um, and trying to frame out what this might look like for the city of Boston. So thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and uh, Ms. Alvarez, um, Mr. Creeley has joined us, so you don't have to give an overview for both. Welcome, Mr. Creeley. We're going to have Ms. Alvarez speak, and then it'll be uh, your opportunity for a brief opening statement, and then we'll open up for counselors' questions. So, Ms. Alvarez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to Councillor Bach and, and everyone in the city who's championing the idea of a youth conservation corps that then leads to future, future careers. I think this is amazing and so long overdue. I'm here to briefly describe, kind of give you an in-depth look of what it takes to run a youth conservation corps. I work for the Southwest Boston CDC. For the past 12 years, we've employed well over 150 youth um, doing um, environmental stewardship and receiving um, life skills and job readiness training. So um, guided by Paul Sutton from the Parks Department, our youth build and restore walking trails. They remove trash, construction de debris, invasive plants. They clean perimeters and entrances around urban wilds. They plant native species, prune trees, create swales for water runoff. And as importantly, they educate the community about the value of the urban wilds and how to properly use and care for them. Um, how our program benefits the community. As everyone has talked about, Tree canopy helps to mitigate the impact of climate change. Trees cool and clean the air, their root systems clean groundwater and prevent flooding, but they can't do their job without regular maintenance. And the Parks Department doesn't have the resources to take care of all 30 plus urban wilds in the city, nine of which happen to be in our neighborhood, Hyde Park. So that's why our work is so important. But how the work benefits youth specifically is it provides them with much needed income it prepares them for long-term success because we provide extensive life skills and job readiness training. 
each summer. Um, it also, this is something that's not often talked about. It improves their physical health because they're outside working. It also improves their cognitive, neurological, and emotional development, which is quite different. The experiences they get in nature that impact their brain is quite different from what they get in school or on electronics. There's been a lot of research in this area. So in our program, what youth learn are concrete landscaping skills. They learn proper and safe use of tools. They learn the causes of climate change and how it's gonna impact the community. They learn how conservation land helps mitigate those impacts. They learn proper workplace conduct. They learn teamwork, problem solving, conflict resolution. They learn how to write resumes and conduct interviews. They learn how to open bank accounts, do budgeting, and learn about credit. They talk with colleges, two-year and four-year colleges, and professionals in the green building trades. And they get involved in civic engagement, identifying and addressing issues that affect them. This year, the green team hosted a candidates forum for our state representative primary race. And they asked questions about the environment, about food insecurity, about housing, so it was a real opportunity for them to learn even more uh, than they usually do. Um, and again, the idea of this being a first step toward a longer career and certification for the kinds of programs that Dave is gonna talk about is critical. The last thing I wanna say, and I cannot stress this enough, is that staff capacity makes or breaks a youth jobs core. We have seen that because youth are using sharp tools, they're working outside in the heat and in the rain, the work is demanding, they need constant motivation and support, close supervision, and they often come with their own emotional problems, behavioral problems that impact the team dynamics. Um, and those all have to be addressed, be addressed properly. Because of that, you need really skilled crew leaders and you need a ratio of no more than four to five youth per crew leader. So you need that many staff. And this has been an issue we've had with DYE every year is that they provide us for 15 youth, one staff person, that's not enough. We raise money to hire additional staff and it's not a job that interns can do. They can help, but you really need qualified staff um, and you also need staff to manage the program to do the hiring and the program development and the day-to-day -day management and the program evaluation. So it is not an inexpensive operation um, to do it right. So uh, the last thing I'll say is that we rely on DYEE to pay youth salaries. The USDA Forest Service has been an amazing friend to us, providing tools and interns. Um, Parks Department field staff are what it's all about. They determine the scope of work. They provide on-site landscape training and they oversee the work. And so we're really happy to hear that the, in, after January, there'll be more park, uh, park management field staff um, because we can't do our work without them. So thank you very much and please come and visit the green team this summer. Uh, you can be visiting the green team this summer, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Queeley, uh, did, you had an opening statement, then we'll get into questions. Welcome. Thank you. Um, morning. I want to thank uh, Chair O'Malley, Councillor Bach, her staff, and the counselors for asking me to speak today. I'm Dave Queeley, Director of Eco Innovation at the Codman Square in DC, a community development corporation in, in Dorchester, Boston's largest and most diverse neighborhood. We've served this neighborhood for over 40 years. Our mission is to build a cohesive, resilient community in Codman Square in South Dorchester, develop affordable housing and commercial spaces that are safe and sustainable, and promote economic stability for low and moderate income of all present residents of all ages. Um, we're part of the Fairmont Indigo Collaborative, uh, along with my colleague Pat. Uh, FICC serves the predominantly low and moderate income neighborhoods along the Fairmont commuter, commuter rail line from Hyde Park to North Dorchester in Boston. We have a strong record of building new affordable and mixed income housing, creating development opportunities and developing avenues to foster resident and youth leadership. As someone who's been certified by the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program as a green infrastructure practitioner and instructor, we've just completed our first certification class 
that consisted entirely of local residents of color. We focused our efforts on recruiting men of color, reentry citizens, and others that have been disenfranchised from the workforce. We plan to give more classes and already have a short list of people for our next class in 2021. NGICP certification gives participants broad knowledge that allows them to help construct, inspect, and maintain green infrastructure, such as green roofs, rain gardens, bioswales, tree trenches, and other nature-based solutions that will help the city meet its stormwater and other climate-related needs, such as reducing urban heat island effect. Given that the impacts of climate change are here, that climate change more often impacts low-income residents that we serve, we feel the creation of a green core could support the residents in the city of Boston in several ways that would help the city meet its economic and social needs while help also helping it meet its climate related goals. One, the Green Corps could assist the city in completing capital projects that are sometimes left undone due to a lack of staffing. Green Corps that is tra trained and certified in GI and made up of youth, reentry citizens, and people disenfranchised from the workforce could provide a homegrown workforce to complete related nature based projects. A vocational high school such as Madison Park High School along with Roxbury Community College could serve as sources of Green Corps students and could work together to build a savvy local workforce that will help build green infrastructure here at home while also providing experiences and learning opportunities in related fields that build resumes and enhance opportunities for meaningful work. Green Corps members and others trained and certified in green infrastructure could help Boston Water and Sewer meet its stormwater reduction and cleaning targets. In partnership with the Nature Conservancy, we recently completed a green paper that lays out the case for robust green infrastructure training and certification programs that would help the city and private developers of green infrastructure to ins construct, inspect, and maintain green infrastructure around the city to nationally accepted standards. I think there are something like 2,600 uh, public and private green infrastructure facilities in the city already. Um, we've also already established a partnership with the Mass Clean Energy Center where participants in our program can get six to 10 week paid internships with green infrastructure companies such as green roof companies. The Green Corps could be a critical part of this effort by providing a pipeline of local certified people ages 18 or older with the opportunity to learn, build skills, enhance their resumes, and hopefully pursue careers in a needed and growing field. I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak and so will submit my comments and the aforementioned paper to you for the record. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna start with the qu uh, counselor's questions uh, and it will begin with the lead sponsor, Councillor Bach, uh, followed by Councillor Bach, I believe will be Councillor Baker. Oh, uh, yes, I believe Councillor Baker and then Councillor Saibu George, but if I have that uh, order incorrectly, uh, I will uh, remedy that. So Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, it's so it's so encouraging to know about the work that is happening already in the city. Um, and, and like I say, I mean, obviously the work ahead of us is how do we how do we join things up and scale things up? Um, and how do we use the city's mechanisms as a driver of that? Um, but you have to you have to have you know these pilots in the first place in order to be able to having this conversation. So really grateful to you all. Um, I'll I'll start with a couple of questions uh, and then be mindful of my colleagues. Um, one is just Dave. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on green infrastructure. I feel sometimes like people here watch the hearing at home and they're like, well, what is green infrastructure? Is you know is it gray to green infrastructure do we change the paint color right like and I just I wonder if you could um could speak a little to just to help folks know like what that what that entails and what the types of certifications you're talking about are because I totally agree with you mm -hmm. we've got a a piece of this that we haven't talked about a lot today but we need to be talking about is sort of how how we build this into the Madison Parks curriculum how we how we just seize a competitive advantage right in a market that we know we're gonna drive demand in um, but I would love if you could just speak a little bit more about what green infrastructure really looks like yeah just to speak to that last point I think that competitive advantage is critical because you know you're seeing kids from outlying um, vocational technical high schools kind of so to speak, eating our lunch in terms of getting the jobs that our kids locally should be should be getting. So I think it's critical to build that pipeline. Um, green infrastructure is really replacing the existing system of stormwater pipes and vaults and, and 
storage areas with nature-based solutions. So creating green roofs, creating rain gardens, cre removing sidewalks and creating bioswales so that water gets held and captured and re returned to the water cycle, the natural water cycle much more quickly. Um, streets and sidewalks and hardscapes that funnel water down into the stormwater system, we're all number one paying for that stormwater system to process that water and clean it. And it's a lot cheaper to create nature-based solutions like green roofs and, and rain gardens to basically clean that water, not for free, but it's a lot cheaper to do it than putting in a new pipeline system or a new vault or uh, recreating the existing gray water system that's out there now. Um, I know Boston Water and Sewer has some mandates that it has to meet for the next 30 years in terms of stormwater reduction. I think phosphorus is the focus of that um, of that EPA mandate, that MS4 uh, mandate. And so uh, they're already doing um, some green infrastructure facilities. I know they've partnered with some schools and put some in and, and other private entities are putting some in, but really we need to begin to measure the impact of those. And I know they've started that. Um, so I, does that answer your does that answer your question or? Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think just, I think we have to, to your point, we're under that EPA decision, but the reality is we've got our own yeah. 10, 20 year and 30 year timelines, right? When it comes to our climate adaptation plans. Um, and it feels like the types of things you're describing, we don't, we're not doing at scale and we don't have the workforce right now, so. Yeah, and I know there's no, as far as I know, there's no kind of broad um, green infrastructure plan that cuts across departments in the city. And I think that's gonna be needed as well. You know, parks, BTD, Boston Water and Sewer and probably Public Works are the key agencies in terms of creating a cohesive or comprehensive plan to address green infrastructure. So um, I can see the deed for that. Great, and then a question for Jesse. Um, Jesse, I was wondering if you could speak to, uh, you know, obviously we're thinking about what we can do at the city level um, and we really appreciate the, the fact that you've been partnering from the federal U.S. forest level with a lot of the programs that we're also partnering with at the city level. Um, but I wonder, you know, if obviously if we were training more arborists in the city, we would we would hope that some of those would be folks who could stay with us long term. Like I mentioned, I think it would be great if we had more of an elite arborist workforce inside of the city. Um, but obviously for a pipe, a workforce development pipeline to be to scale, we need for those young people to have lots of opportunities also outside of being employed by the city of Boston. Um, and, and so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what that landscape of jobs in forestry, urban forestry kind of is since you come from a more national perspective. Um, and also I know that um, when you and I talked before, you talked a little bit about there's a sort of 21st century service corps that allows, allows us to affiliate, you know, potential programs with this federal effort so that the young people who work in it, um, and not just young people, right, um, also veterans. And, and I think Dave referred to the fact that like thinking about could we, could we create a pathway for folks to come out of incarceration? I think there's a lot of different options here, but I think with that federal program, it creates the opportunity to be more um, to be in the mix for non-competitive hiring for some federal agency jobs. And so I just wondered if you could speak to that aspect of the, of the program, because we, we would, we want to employ all the people in the city of Boston, but we can't quite manage it. So it'd be good to know about the rest of the field. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as far as the, um, the uh, different careers and, and uh, opportunities within urban forestry and beyond, um, you know, there are actually quite a few. Um, if you're looking at a, a young person who um, has a college degree, um, you know, or the arborist training, um, you know, they can work with, um, well, really more on the state level when it comes to our, our local level, when it comes to uh, specifically urban forestry. We do have urban, an urban forestry program within the agency. Um, that uh, really works um, across states um, to engage um, in, you know, whether it's, it's um, forest health, uh, infrastructure, research, development. Um, and so uh, those, those types of jobs are quite limited uh, in the Forest Service at the federal level. Um, however, you know, similar positions do um, do occur across federal agencies. So, um, so you know, there are those opportunities. Um, I think 
where the, the biggest bang for the buck as far as the pipeline is concerned, uh, really is gonna be, um, you know, those local opportunities, um, whether it's uh, with the cities or uh, state jobs, DCR, um, municipalities. Um, but then also, uh, you know, when you look at the, the broader picture of related jobs to urban forestry, um, you know, again, once you have that training, the training really is the key. Once you have the training, um, it opens the door to so many different opportunities, whether or not that's uh, the climate adaptation work that's going on, whether or not that's, um, you know, again, the forest health, um, uh, public engagement, um, you know, it, it really kind of runs a, a, a pretty broad spectrum of opportunities. Um, and we really are uh, interested in seeing those, those pipelines created. Um, you mentioned the 21st Century Conservation Service Corps, uh, which is a federal um, effort that was created a number of years ago to really work with um, communities, local organizations that are hiring young people who um, are working, really doing any sort of work that uh, benefits the environment, whether that is mowing lawns, um, planting trees, so on and so forth. Organizations um, have been able to join the 21st Century Conservation Service Corps, which was modeled after the Civilian Conservation Service Corps, um, but was supposed to, is supposed to be a, a modern day take on it. Uh, so that, you know, we are employing young people 16 uh, to 25 uh, years old um, and veterans up to the age of 35 who are, um, again, giving back to our communities, uh, working to um, working in stewardship, environmental stewardship. And um, there's a piece of that that allows them to actually uh, use those hours that they're being paid to count towards a special hiring certificate um, to, to apply for a job with um, a land management agency like the Forest Service, the Park Service, um, um, Fish and Wildlife Service. And so those opportunities are there. And uh, again, um, you know, once they have that training, once they have the education, um, there's a whole broad spectrum of, of environmental jobs that are available, available to them. And you also mentioned, um, I was going to mention the Worcester Tree Initiative, which was a program that was started uh, around the Asian longhorn beetle uh, outbreak that um, really looked at taking people who were uh, incarcer incarcerated at some point, uh, system involved, uh, and training them, giving them the training to, um, you know, do that uh, arborist type work planting trees, taking care of them, uh, managing them. And the Forest Service was involved in, in actually helping to get that program up and running. Fantastic. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, questions for Pat and David, but I can hold them and allow colleagues to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will we'll come back to you, Councillor Bach. Um, Jesse, thank you for mentioning the uh, Asian longhorn beetle outbreak. I just want to take this opportunity. So. For those who may not be aware of what had happened, it was probably two months after I was elected. So this is back in 2010, where uh, the ALB was discovered in the Arnold Arboretum. And it could have been absolutely disastrous. I mean, literally the entire Arboretum, the, the, the entire park could have had been decimated, um, but it was quick work with some really great coordination um, with the federal, state and city government and wanted to give special kudos to the uh, US Department of Forestry, uh, Forestry for really some nimble great work that saved tens of thousands of trees because of that. I mean, it was just, it was just remarkable. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Councillor Braden, you have the floor next uh, for questions. Thank you. Um, this, this whole discussion is, is very uh, wide ranging and very exciting. Um, I, I'm just curious as well, we have some, um, eminent uh, centers of higher education in all in in Boston um, are there partnerships with like Harvard or the Arbor Arnold Arboretum and and other university level pro um, level programs uh, in the city and are they doing anything 
to support this work because they do have significant land holdings in the city and uh, I'm sure they need, um, they might be another source of employment for these young people once they're trained, not just in the city, city itself, the government of the city, but in other big institutions in the city. Are we working on partnerships with, with other large nonprofits in the city to, um, or is that something that's been thought about? Thank you. I, I know a little bit, I, I, I'm not familiar with a lot. I mean, the, the Arboretum clearly, um, you know, is a well-established organization that's affiliated and owned by Harvard. Um, and Harvard actually also runs Harvard Forest, which is about an hour west of, um, of Boston, that, that's a research forest. And I know that both those uh, institutions do have an education and outreach arm to them. And I, I just discovered the other week that, um, that the Arboretum does have a summer program with Norfolk Aggie, where they train high school students um, on boriculture and, and forestry. Um, Boston's um, Vogue Tech program does not have a green focus at all. They, they focus on other things. And, and I think it would be interesting to think about opportunities to expand the Vogue Tech or, or be more inclusive uh, to, to Mr. Queeley's point around you know, the, these other Vogue Tech programs outside of the city um, are coming in and, and taking these jobs. How does BPS fit into this? And then how do we leverage the resources to your point, Councilwoman, um, that are already in Boston um, to, to really create something that is homegrown um, and that takes, and I know BU, for example, has a very strong um, environmental urban forestry focus, more on research than on practice. Um, but there are plenty of resources and opportunities here um, across the city um, and, you know, thing, things to explore, get, it, you know, the, these, these nested eggs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. I think this, we have a lot of resources that are being left on the table. And to your point, uh, I think of a, of, of a Vogue Tech high school from out, out of, you know, in Norfolk County is taking advantage of, of a, a, the infrastructure here in the city then begs the question, why is our not our Vogue Tech high school um, not doing the same? And why do we not have a an urban forestry st strand um, in, in that high school. So uh, there's obviously some work to do in that area that, that could, that could uh, prove very fruitful. Um, I think that's the only, the only question I had for now. Thank Does you. Anybody, sorry, um, I, I think some of the folks on here might know a bit about the UMass involvement. I mean, both in Boston and Amherst in this space. And I didn't know if anyone wanted to comment on that. I know very little, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, I do know that the Forest Service works, um, uh, actually has researchers at UMass Boston Amherst uh, working with, um, with the university there, and um, especially around urban forestry um, and engaging the communities out that way. Um, we have worked uh, a little bit with UMass Boston, um, their School for the Environment, uh, and we were um, in the process of uh, developing a partnership with them to um, uh, connect the university with um, the White Mountain National Forest. Specifically, um, the forest was very interested in having um, um, the students come up and, you know, conduct uh, whatever research or um, uh, uh, some work that uh, the forest might uh, have available and figure out how to, you know, really get the university involved in that work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, through um, uh, attrition, we lost those contacts at the university. Uh, we lost uh, one of their main professors and um, the dean um, in one, one swoop. So uh, we're in the process of rebuilding those connections. Thank you. I just wanna quickly put a plug for um, UMass Amherst and, and we've actually applied for a grant to work with some of their professors this summer to you know, layer on to our teen urban tree core program, a more robust training program. Um, so we're mindful of the expertise there and the work they do, 
um, in forestry and in urban forestry and, and the partnerships between the US Forest Service staff there um, and the work they do across the state. So um, we're mindful of that and, and look forward to finding ways to incorporate that in our own program and then think about how that might fit with the city. I can see a, I can see a mapping a mapping exercise connect all the dots connecting all these dots and seeing how we can make something really great out of this. Thank you. <laughs> here, here. Well said, Councilor Braden. Thank you, um, uh, Councilor Bach. You had a, a second round of questions, so we'll return to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I know we've also got public testimony, um, but uh, I just wanted to um, I wanted well I wanted to ask Pat uh, if she could speak a little bit to. Again, this is a little bit in the in the realm of kind of making these things real for folks. I think that um, I think there really are there's really like a twin goal here. There's the workforce development, and then there's also just the scale of um, of you know work and support that our our green spaces need, our trees, our urban wilds, um, our uh, our green infrastructure. And so I wondered if you could um, just tell people a little bit about what the green team, I mean, you talked about what they did, but you were talking more kind of conceptually. And if you could just give people a sense of like what that looks like on the ground and what it would mean like to scale up in terms of the types of projects that, that the young people are able to get done. You mean the kinds of actual physical work that they do? Yeah, and just like what, um, like what, what, what's sort of the result of that work? So we, what we have very small urban wilds and very large urban wilds in Hyde Park. Um, we've had uh, small ones where they were just hadn't been touched in years. So it was a question of clearing away dead trees, dead plants, uh, planting new, taking away invasives planting new plants, which require watering. We would engage neighborhood residents in helping to water during the spring and the fall when the green team wasn't operating and the green team would do the watering. Um, they would do without, you know, during non-COVID years, they'd go door to door, knock on doors, talking to residents about the urban wild, why it's important, how to use it properly, how to care for it. And then at the larger sites, we've done, you know, we've built trails, through the woods, we've we've restored trails that were deteriorated. Um, we've taken an area that needed to be cleaned out. We've taken out all the again all the debris, all the invasives, and planted all new um, you know uh, native plants and trees. We've created swales and improved on existing swales for water runoff. Um, We've, you name it. I mean, we, we learn how to identify invasive plants and how to properly remove them so they don't come back. We learn how to cultivate native plants that help, to, that help the urban wild stay safer. We remove lots of construction debris that gets dumped. We remove trash. Um, we take residents on tours so they understand the woods. We engage volunteers. We engage corporate volunteers. We had a, a, a training one year with the uh, Charles River Watershed Association because believe it or not, the, there's, uh, the Stony Brook runs under our Sharon Woods Urban Wild and Hyde Park and empties into the Charles River. So they had an interest in working with us and we came together. Our youth taught them about the woods, taught them about what we're doing and they got involved. So the youth were teaching the adults. Um, I'm not sure what else, what other kind of detailed questions can I answer about our, about our stewardship work? Um, I think um, that kind of covers and you know, the, the actual on the ground work that gets done. Oh, that's, uh, that's amazing. And I think the sky's the limit. I've, I've been privileged to know a bit about what the Emerald Necklace does in a sort of parallel program. And I just think that but I wanna make sure we always use these hearings to let people know about work that's happening in the city um, and give a real, a real tactile sense of what it would be to scale this up. Um, my question for, for David was just, if you could speak a little bit to, I mentioned, we sort of bracketed having our, our sister cities come in and, and speak with us to another time because uh, it's the la second to last day of council session and we have four hearings today. Um, but I wondered if you could just speak briefly about sort of in your work, looking at what other cities are doing and in terms of the scale of, of Arborist staff and just, um, uh, you know, sure. programs like what, what's, what's the world out there that we should be looking at on the tree side. And, you know, 
when when we were founded a couple of years ago, I didn't realize that there is a whole world out there around urban forestry. And it's really amazing to see what other cities are doing. Uh, and we're lucky enough to partner. You met uh, Ms. Anderson this morning uh, with American Forests and also with the Arbor Day Foundation. So there's a rich network of both national and then local organizations that we've learned from. And I'll just highlight a couple that I, I did some research on. At Tree Atlanta has the Youth Tree Team, which is a, a summer program that employs high school students and they learn about pruning, mulching, weeding, and planting. Friends of the Urban Forest, we've modeled um, in San Francisco, has a program called the Green Teens Program that prepares teens for uh, green jobs. And that is a one or two year program. Uh, Jesse Scott uh, partnered with us with the Greeting Youth Foundation out of Atlanta, um, and they supported one of our team leaders. They run the Youth Urban Core program that trains inner city youth from 17 to 25 in the field of conservation. Open Lands in Chicago, I spoke to my colleague yesterday at the Arbor Day Foundation. Uh, they have a forestry training program, and I believe that they're right now um, developing a partnership with the U.S. Department of Labor around um, training. Keep Indianapolis Beautiful, uh, Kibby, as they're known, uh, runs the Youth Tree Team, which is a seven week summer job program. Um, and then there's also one in Iowa here, Trees Forever runs a Growing Futures program. Um, so I think again, uh, to your point, the sky is the limit. We have a lot to learn from what other cities and states are doing. Um, and I think this is a great sort of leaping off point for us to to think about how this might work locally. Um, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is out there. We just sort of have to adapt it to the local circumstances. And can I just mention something else about scaling up? I mean, what some of the things that are required are tools, equipment, supplies, sheds to store things in, transportation. Our, except for COVID this year, our youth use bicycles. We give everyone bicycles to, to get around their works to their work sites. Um, all the training, the, their job readiness training is done by pro bono trainers. So either that means finding more trainers like from the local colleges or paying people to do training in job readiness and life skills. Um, uh, and um, it requires, I can't, again, I'm going to stress again, staff capacity. You know, a very small, you know, no more than four or five kids per youth when you're working outside. And that's not inexpensive to do, but it's well worth it because that's what creates a good program. Can, and can I mention one other thing related to the whole world of uh, environmental stewardship that it doesn't get talked about? And that to educate, and this is something that I think youth could also do, help do, is educating the community about the urban wilds that are their yards, about the tree canopy in their yards, about the grass and the bushes and the shrubs, because I see more and more and more throughout the city, people just clear cutting the, the greenery in their own yards, which is disastrous. It's, it's creating heat island effect. Uh, it causes all kinds of health problems. It's terrible for the environment. And many people, especially newcomers, don't, don't know this. And I don't see that the city is doing any education on this at all. And okay. it's critical. And Pat, to your point, the, the tree canopy assessment that the city released earlier this year shows exactly that, is that uh, all, most of the loss on the tree canopy came from private space, not public space. So exactly. I think that's a point well taken. Yeah. Great, thank you both so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I love having these hearings is that it really is more of a conversation. So I appreciate all the sort of the feedback and the great give and take uh, among our panelists and counselors. So um, I don't have any further questions, uh, Councilor Buck or Councilor Braden. If you don't have uh, any further questions for this panel, um, thank you. We are going to now work on to public testimony. Uh, I have three who had signed up: Sarah Freeman, Laura Holmes, and Caroline Reeves. Um, I. Uh, so I've, we've admitted Sarah and Lore. Um, I don't see Caroline Reeves. Um, I know Karen Monty Broderick from the ANC is with us, so I don't know if she was wanted to speak as well. But um, uh, just raise your hand if any of oh, there's Karen. Any, so there are four individuals, uh, two of whom may be Karen uh, in the attendees. So just raise your hand if you would like to speak, uh, and I will admit you. Um, and we will now begin with uh, a woman who always blushes when I refer to her as such. 
my favorite constituent, uh, Sarah Freeman, great to see you. Um, I don't, Margot, there's maybe a hint of red in her hair, her hair, so she may join us uh, as chair, <laughs> but uh, Sarah, great to see you virtually and, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, quite an introduction. Um, yeah, her hair does look like it's, uh, it has some tints in it, so that'll be fun to watch. Is this her first hearing? No, she's actually had quite a few hearings and, uh, and even some council meetings. So she's an old pro. Uh, so thank you. We'll, we'll awesome. Get, we'll get her vested before this is over. Until <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to Councillor Bach for um, initiating this idea. I love it. And um, I think you all know I tend to support green initiatives. Uh, you may not know I'm a former teacher and I love the idea of the youth jobs and career paths. And those of you who remember Sam Sherwood, um, who's no longer with us, he used to say, we ought to have a, a equivalent of Civilian Conservation Corps, but we never got around to doing anything about it. So really appreciative. Um, a few quick comments. Councillor Baker really hit a nerve when he pointed out that trees have gotten planted but don't survive. I think way too many, whether it's street trees or um, whatever, it, it really is painful to, to see them not survive. And even if they're under warranty and get a replacement tree, you never end up with a mature tree. Um, I won't say never, but all too often. And things like invasives removal, that's a lot of specialized work. And the park maintenance staff, um, they've worked hard and it's been pointed out today during the pandemic, they kept the parks open, but they do things like they mow the grass, they work on, they empty the trash, but you don't see them doing the specialized invasives work. A lot of that is either done by volunteers or not done. Um, UMass Extension used to have a program that the Arbor Way Coalition partnered with years ago. It was 2004 when they had uh, the Boston Green Space Alliance had the Plant Yourself in the Park Day. And we um, got a grant for aeration watering loops uh, you couldn't use it for trees, but DCR planted trees. We had those loops where if you water it, it, the water goes down into the underground, right to the roots. But we needed volunteers to do the watering and some neighbors volunteered, but in the areas where there weren't houses nearby, we hired those uh, urban youth and it was a really feel good opportunity um, that we got to know some of the kids and at the end of the summer, they held a joint program where they made certificates for everyone who had been watering and they baked cookies and more to the point, it hopefully gave those young people a, uh, a sense of importance that, that they were helping the community. And I'll leave you with one anecdote uh, about the Emerald Necklace who has, uh, it's come up earlier today, has the green team. We tend not to know what becomes of those kids, but this winter I had, or fall, had some insulation done in my attic um, and through one of those mass save programs and they uh, left one little bit undone. And so when I got the survey, I reported that and the supervisor came as a follow-up appointment. And when he walked in, he said, do I know you? And it turns out he was one of those green team kids grown up and had gone into um, an energy related field. So I thought that was uh, very, very encouraging to find out. So uh, thank you. I hope you all do this and I'm happy to support however I can. 
Thank you, Sarah. And that, that's a great story, uh, how things uh, really just how the green economy is growing and to see, to see these young people uh, get terrific careers and well-paying and needed careers as well. So thank you for that. Uh, Laura Holmes, another dear friend from Cerro Corporation. The floor is now yours. And then Karen, uh, you will be uh, after Laura. So uh, Laura, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman O'Malley and Councillor Bach for convening this hearing and for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm reading so that I can be mindful about my time and stay on track. I'm Laura Holmes, general manager and proud worker owner with Seto Cooperative. Since 2014, Seto has been harvesting thousands of tons of Boston area inedible food waste and upcycling that resource to support a local food economy. Founded by black and Latinx Bostonians who set out to create green collar jobs and business ownership back in 2012, Seto's success demonstrates great potential for scaling green business development. We applaud you, Councillor Bach, and this committee for taking the lead to establish the Conservation Corps, and glad to see the nonprofit speakers collaborating on this too. It's important also to recognize that there's deep expertise in the community private sector as well. Responsible MBE contractors want to grow with qualified employees, and they should be involved in building the career ladders too. People like David Hurst, who started his landscaping business in Mattapan 26 years ago in the community where he was born and raised. Mr. Hurst's dream has always been to help local young entrepreneurs learn sustainable landscaping and business skills that will prepare them to build bid on contracts and perform them well, building and maintaining green infrastructure in Boston. So while job, uh, youth job training is great, let's also find ways to help small businesses like Hearst Landscaping scale and support green small business development that can address adult and re-entering citizens employment too. These are communities, as we know, affected by environmental injustice as well as deep unemployment, especially now. Last year, Soto teamed up with Mr. Hearst and other partners to propose a Green New Deal Innovation Center in Mattapan where David could grow his dream in a training center designed to prepare community members and re-entering citizens for green jobs of the future. In addition, at this Green New Deal Innovation Center, we can heat large commercial greenhouses with clean energy made from recycled food waste, build microgrids, and provide supply chain jobs in urban agriculture and clean energy technologies. I know there will be another hearing to get more into the Green New Deal topic uh, more broadly, um, and I look forward to that because models to scale and shovel ready projects are ready to go right here in our neighborhoods and they deserve priority investment and support. So let's leverage this opportunity as a beginning and ensure that we make it happen in ways that are inclusive and equitable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I see we have been joined by Carolyn Reeves. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to go to Karen Amani Brodick from the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, uh, and then uh, Ms. Reeves, uh, you will you will have the floor. Um, Karen, the floor is yours. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Karen Amani Brodick from the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. I'm really really thrilled that this conversation is happening. Um, you know, one of the things that I have enjoyed most about um, the work that we do at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is our green team, uh, where, and I'm, this is my, this is my version of sharing screen. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the kids out there uh, planting uh, our, our summer youth program, which we call our green team. Um, over the last several years, we've had hundreds of kids go through our summer program and then also our after school program during the school year when it gets dark. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, you know, things um, that involve more teaching uh, and, you know, uh, classroom type education. I want to just really um, stress the thoughtful comments of particularly Pat Alvarez, um, who is a strong partner of ours of the Southwest CDC. I think that the points that she was making about um, the need to make sure we every year we fundraise for um, for the uh, staff that we hire to work with the, the youth. Um, it is really important that there's a really good um, supervision ratio. So that's a really important point that, that Pat is making. And I really hope that that's taken to heart. Um, uh, you know, and 
I think the concepts that have come up today about going to scale and trying to be bigger is uh, is important. You know, this summer we were really happy that we were able to shift our entire program virtual to a virtual education program, so we could continue to support the city's goals of youth employment. Uh, we wanted to have as many as 100 kids in our program, but instead only 30 spots were filled. And so this this points to the fact that there might be some real opportunities to think about where are the where is the bottleneck? Is the bottleneck in finding the kids in the, for the program? Is it about interesting them in the work? Um, is it about uh, some something else? I, I you know is it about additional resources? I'm not sure what. Uh, this is something that I'm really hoping we can look into because I do think it would be good to you know have the opportunity to scale up. For example, this fall we've been trying to start our program also uh, with the city and we we, we have interviewed we, uh, we had over 100 applicants we interviewed 30 students and we have now understood that we are able to have six slots so there's um i don't know if that's funding or if it's hiring capacity or staffing capacity so i think these are all important questions to ask as we um go forward where where are the where where have been the the factors that have limited us in the past and how can um can those be changed uh, also, Jesse Scott um, has been a great partner. I just want to respond to a couple of questions um, that were brought up before. Councilor Braden, yes, the Arnold Arboretum does have a youth education program. We partner with them. Um, our youth go to the Arboretum um, and get really great training from the amazing experts there every year. Um, I think these, we have so many resources in the city. Um, uh, this summer, actually, that was really one of the strong points of our program is that we partnered with the Southwest CDC and a bunch of other organization, Mattapan Food and Fitness. So we all kind of could provide different pieces of the curriculum and expand what we did. So I think that everybody wants to do this. It's about the time and the resources and knowing in advance how many youth we can place um, and when that date will start. Those things have sometimes been a little bit of a shifting, uh, a shifting landscape for us and it's hard to plan and make a really robust curriculum. Um, I think that it is, I think uh, uh, Chief Cook, Chief Cook's point earlier about making sure it's a really high quality program is really important. Um, just, you know, you know, unleashing a bunch of wonderful, excited, interested kids into the environment is good, but it's not going to interest folks in careers unless we give them exciting, stimulating things. We have sophisticated, smart kids in the city, so we need to make sure that um, that we we challenge them and we show them that there is this opportunity. Um, I am a, I consider myself an urban uh, parks professional. I've worked in New York and San Francisco, and throughout my life, I run into people that are in environmental careers that started as New York City lifeguards. Um, it's it is clear to me that if we can start um, people young in these fields, that they do find um, a path. But I think the, the analogy about needing to fix the pipe is so important because um, right now, we don't always have the opportunity to, to, to like, we give students resume writing, uh, job interview training, all of those things, but we don't like check in with them again in six months and say, hey, do you need help finding an internship? Or, hey, if you found out about the city college program, like there's ways that we can, I think, um, be bridging those divides that are not um, that are, are not happening happening now. Um, I, I there's there's so much more to say, and I know that there's like limited time for you to hear from all of us. But um, you know, I'm very excited about these conversations. Our urban forestry program, which um, you know we partner with the city and the state and others to to hire um, you know the certified arborists. You've heard so much about to do all the tree work. Um, you know, there's definitely a limited number of those folks in uh, Massachusetts. Um, we, when we bid contracts, unfortunately, sometimes we don't always get the most competitive prices. So by bringing more people in this field, not only will we be training people for good jobs, but we potentially be saving, um, you know, the city and the private sector and the donate, the sector that raises money through donations uh, funds by, you know, um, having a greater pool of people that can uh, do this work and, and, and do it better for all of us. Um, I wanted to just mention two, one program that I, okay, I know. I'm, Thanks, I'm, Karen. Okay, all right. Thank, thank you. Uh, Ms. Reeves, you have the floor. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. Um, my name is Carolyn Reeves. I'm with the Muddy Water Initiative. In August of this year, with the help of the city, we launched our Water Go, which is a trash removal device. We launched it in the Charles Gate Fence, part of the Emerald Necklace. And every week since August 5th, we have had teams of volunteers down on the river cleaning out trash from the river. 
um, it's been a huge success. We've had over 100 volunteers down there. What I wanted to mention today is that the, the creation of, Bo of a Boston Conservation Corps will harness the kind of energy and enthusiasm and can-do spirit that our Boston communities really exhibit when they're down on the river with us. This is something that makes people excited. They want to do it. It builds goodwill. Working for a positive cause, making a change in something that seems intractable, environmental degradation, is something that moves people. Most of our volunteers come back more than once. Uh, sometimes they come back every week. Uh, they want to be involved. So I just wanted to speak very briefly to the idea that this is a cause that unleashes people's potentials. Once they're there, they're excited about it. And when Karen says, you know, we once they're hooked, they, they make careers in environmentalism, people feel good about doing this work. So I'm so excited to hear that a Boston Conservation Corps is, is, is an idea and something that might happen um, because I know it's something that makes Boston residents excited. We've had urban youth, we've had retirees, we've had professional people, uh, we've had students uh, of, of all ages down on the river and all of them love getting their hands dirty to do work that they know will make their future brighter. Please make this happen, City of Boston. Please give our residents this opportunity. And the Muddy Water Initiative will do anything we can um, to help make this a reality. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reeves. Appreciate your great work as well as Karen's great work. Um, not seeing any other uh, uh, opportunities for public testimony or individuals looking to make a public testimony. Uh, Councillor Braden, and we're gonna close with Councillor Bach, but Councillor Braden, did you have any concluding thoughts or comments? Councillor No, I, 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 there's a blue hand. Oh, I, I do apologize. Um, ah, yes, H. Parker James. I apologize, I missed that. I am going to promote you to panelist. And um, you, the floor is now yours for H. Parker James. Uh, feel free to turn your video on or, oh, there you are. So um, I just wanna speak very briefly. Um, the, I'm Parker James, I work for the Charles Gate Alliance. We're associated uh, um, both with the uh, Muddy Water Initiative and with the Emerald Necklace. Um, I just want to speak to one issue, um, which is uh, we are extremely enthusiastic about the creation of a Boston Conservation Corps. Uh, but um, in Charles Gate and in the Muddy River and along the Charles River, um, that's, there's land that is part of the city of Boston, but is in, um, is part of the uh, DCR and therefore um, in the control of the Commonwealth. It would be so wonderful if the Boston Conservation Corps could be framed in a manner that the workers could work on uh, DCR land as well as Boston city land. Um, but regardless of that, uh, uh, all of us are very, strongly in favor of, um, of doing this. And thank you uh, both Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley for um, sponsoring this uh, legislation. That's it. Th thank you, Mr. James and well said, certainly think the partnership between the state and the city is crucial for this particularly DCR, um, which is such a, a vital part of our park system and park e uh, in ecosystem in Boston. Um, so I, uh, I'm just double checking. I don't see any other blue hands raised. Um, so again, Councillor Bach, the lead sponsor, is going to have the final word. But before we get to her, uh, Councillor Braden, did you uh, want to finish your concluding thoughts? Yeah, I just want to thank um, um, Councillor Bach and 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 yourself, uh, Mr. Chair, for your leadership in this area and to bring this suggestion forward. I, I think it's got huge potential not only in developing our green workforce in Boston, but also in protecting and strengthening and expanding our, um, our urban forest and our tree canopy and protecting our urban wilds. So uh, I'm very, very excited and count me in when it comes to 
trying to develop this and, and get the boat into the water, so to speak. So thank you so much. Also, thank you so much to all the folks who made public comments this morning and all the panelists. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, Councillor Bach, uh, before I turn it over to you, wanted to again thank you for your incredible leadership. I love this idea. I'm so excited to see how we can uh, not only flesh it up, but make it a reality for next year. Um, and I'm glad that we we're able to have this as the final hearing for the Environment Committee. I uh, really uh, appreciate your leadership and, and really excited about this opportunity. So thank you for, for being the visionary here and thank you to the mayor's team. Um, and more importantly, thank you to the incredible advocates who day in and day out uh, trudge uh, in the trenches, uh, often for little or no money uh, to make this a reality. It's great continuing to work with you and really excited to see the urgency of our work continue next year um, at an even heightened pace. So, uh, Councillor Bach, for concluding remarks, the floor is yours. You are muted. I got it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley, um, and for all your leadership on this. Um, very much following in your footsteps on this front. Um, and I, I really do want to thank, I want to thank all of the uh, the advocates. Um, we could have had a whole panel of folks. Um, we've got with Karen at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy uh, and the Muddy Water River Initiative and Charles Gate. Um, and I think a lot about how in my district, the Muddy River um, really is sort of an original case of green infrastructure. Um, in Boston, and uh, and so it's it's important to note that this isn't just some new fangled thing that we're inventing. Um, it's something that uh, that we need to go back to um, and and deepen. Um, and uh, yeah, and I really appreciate all the advocates being on here. I think the whole point of um, of pilot programs is to learn from them, and so it's really important for us to hear from all of you. Um, you know from from Pat and David and Dave and Jesse um, and also Sarah, who's on our first panel um, about like what works and what doesn't and what the key components are here. Um, I'm very aware that as counselors, we, uh, you know, it's, it's not our job, nor is it necessarily our competency to figure out all the best details of a program. Um, what, what is our job, I think, is to like see when we've got a kind of disconnected landscape in the city um, like this, and also just like a, a strong mandate, right, for us to actually meet our climate goals through a totally ramped up urban forestry program, green infrastructure program, as I said, we sort of bracketed it for today, but building retrofit program, um, to an urban wild program, right, to just really like transform all this in our city and to say, okay, well, how are we going to take these disconnected pieces um, and, and help help build that connective tissue so that we've really got a system that works and that gets us where we're trying to go. Um, so I uh, appreciate the administration um, being on this morning um, and all their work. And I think this is definitely going to be a, a tactile conversation um, in the year ahead in the coming months to figure out like what, what are the concrete, you know, budgeting and programmatic steps we need to take to go in this direction. Um, and, and my hope would be that Boston could become a model both for how to tackle climate change and also how to use this opportunity not to just do the same old, but to actually create a real pathway for Bostonians, especially Bostonians of color who are too often shut out of the jobs that um, get funded through city funds. Um, like just totally turn that on its head, right? And make, and uh, to Jesse's point about all the jobs available also in other municipalities, right? Like what, what we want is to train a bunch of folks in Boston and then and then uh, let let other folks employ the ones um, that we're not able to, uh, and that that to me is a a vision that should be a reality here. So um, I'm really grateful for everyone's advocacy, and uh, I'm looking forward to sort of refiling this and continuing to work on it in the new year. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Thank you, everybody. Uh, round of applause are in, uh, is in order. Um, and this hereby concludes this uh, hearing. I look forward to continuing the work in partnership next year. Uh, the hearing is now adjourned. Have a great day, everybody, and happy holidays. Uh, nice to see you all. Great to see you all. And congratulations, Matt. It suits you. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you later.